we did the Joy of Sex, the Alex Comfort book, for example, and CD Rob. <laughs> we got sent the drawings, which were worth a fortune. You know, they're really beautiful drawings in that book. They were quite famous. Yeah. Then. A Securicorn van arrived. We had to pay insurance, and one was missing. And it was the one of an erect penis, as it happened. And we had to get... So the publisher <laughs> were really annoyed. It wasn't us, you know, it got stolen. And uh, the publisher asked us to get a local artist. I got a friend of mine to do a, an erect penis. Yeah. Which he did, but he had to use himself as a model in a mirror. <laughs> and he, he phoned me at the end of the first day and said, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Donald, but I'm really struggling here, you know, because every time he went to do the life drawing, it, 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 it took its natural course. Welcome to The Learning Hack, a podcast about the people and technologies that are creating the future of learning. I'm John Helmer. Now, guess what? Learning, learning is cool. cool. Learning is cool. Did you ever take a look at something you use every day and say, why is it like this? How did it get to be this way? This time, we're asking that question about learning systems. In this episode, we're going to tell the story of learning technology from its earliest beginnings to the present day. And the person we've got to do that for us, our guest this time on The Learning Hack, is somebody who was actually there. We are simply passing through history. This is history. This is history. Hack facts. Growing up in the housing schemes of Livingston, Scotland, Donald Clark went on to study philosophy at Edinburgh University and the prestigious Ivy League Dartmouth College in the US. This is where he first encountered artificial intelligence. Donald was co-founder and CEO of Epic Group PLC, which established itself as the leading e-learning company in the UK, floated on AIM in 1996 and sold in 2005. Now free from what he calls the tyranny of employment, he is CEO of Wildfire, visiting professor to the University of Derby and sits on numerous boards, including those of the University for Industry, City and Guilds, Cogbooks Limited and Learning Pool. He's been there, done it, bought the T-shirt. In fact, he's got all the merch and now is telling us where the bodies are buried. Jay Curtis, Head of Themes. What do we cover on our ramble down this rocky road? Starting in the Stone Age with cave paintings, Donald traces learning's long love affair with technology to the point where computers come on the scene. And it's in this period, before the internet, that I think people will be most surprised by the innovative stuff that was already going on. Including the joy of sex. No sex, please. We're British. Oh, yes. I forgot. Then there's the rise of the LMS, mobile learning, bringing us to where we are now, with consumer technology continuing to drive the future of learning tech and bringing data to the fore. Donald doesn't pull his punches. The fierce commitment to telling his truth sometimes upsets people. But nobody I know of has such a wide and detailed knowledge of the science and theory underpinning learning or has been at the bleeding age of innovation in LearnTech for so many years. Even if you don't agree with all his opinions, you'll still want to hear the way he tells the story of learning technologies. Welcome back, Donald. Your second time uh, on The Learning Hack. Uh, this time it's going to be a brief history of learning systems, a uh, scamper through the history of e-learning, learning technologies, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah. And you were a pretty important part of that history yourself. So I'd like to start with how you got involved with learning technologies in the first place. What were the early roots of, of that interest for you personally? All oh, right, uh, that's a good question. I, I think, you know, the, the earliest roots, I think, is I went to a sort of bulk stand comprehensive in the housing scheme, you know, and the, the, the interesting thing about my early education was I did metalwork, woodwork, and got in technical drawing. I was actually quite good at technical drawing, the only exam I ever got 100%. And so I, I grew up in a world where making things and tradesmen, plumbers, joiners were part of my family, you know. I'd, mm. So I, and I often find, I often reflect now, I, I come across academics who, study technology but really don't like technology it's a bit trade you know yeah. I, I suppose i'm glad i was mercifully free of that you know there are people in university studying technology it's a bit like being in pediatrics and not liking children you know <laughs> so i wonder why they're there doing this stuff it's just yeah. like lay it on looking for weaknesses everywhere but this but the real change for me came so i did a degree in philosophy at the university of edinburgh but i went to the us to study as well to an ivy league there called 
Dartmouth College, and it was a formative moment for me. That was 1979, because Dartmouth, uh, well, first of all, it was the modern era of AI started at Dartmouth, the John McCarthy uh, Conference in 1956. They had a sort of shrine to that there, which is interesting. It was related to philosophy in many ways. So I did a course on philosophical logic, boy, with the DFTO, and the guy who ran that course said, oh, we've got a mainframe. If you, if you want to try some programming, because all programming is based on the logical operators, if then, and or not. Yep. And so I went across and played battleships in this hulking big mainframe <laughs> and did a little bit of coding. We, every student, it was quite enlightened then, you know, compared to British universities. I think American universities are less anti-corporate in that sense. Mm. And so I got an introduction to programming came back, bought a Commodore 64, was doing a lot of traveling in Soviet Russia. Don't, worry, don't ask why at that time. And, and my first program was in the Commodore 64, teaching myself the Russian alphabet and Russian vocabulary. And I went on a Russian language course and so on. And so I got into this by accident. I just sort of bumped in there. I thought, this is interesting, using computers to do a human teaching thing. And so all of those things conspired to, uh, you know, uh, to, to give me that interest in technology on the back of a very esoteric and abstract subject, namely philosophy. That's a very interesting um, route into the industry and really surprising, I, th I think. So I suppose most of us will think of our industry beginning when computers started being used for learning. Uh, but there is a history behind that we ought to cover before we plunge on. Um, technology's always played a part in learning in a sense. If you count blackboards, that's the physical blackboards, not the LMS company. Um, television, radio, all, all that stuff. Yeah, I think, I think they've been really the, the stage one for me actually is a precursor to that. And I've written loads about this now. I wrote a very long piece once. I think the origin of this, the technology has always been used in an evolutionary sense, uh, you know, we've grown up to be learning and teaching beings, a very good book by Gary on this. Uh, but uh, uh, an interesting, the recent scholarship, for example, in the caves in Altamiria, uh, Altamiria, North Spain and France, showing that they're not shamanistic species. They're actually a bit like simulations. You go in and you actually learn how lions hunt because you don't want to be eaten and you have to catch things. So I think we've uh -huh. had a long history. I wrote this big thing about how caves are simulations. Turned out to be right. There's a lot of academic literature on this now. But uh -huh. throughout that whole process, you know, we went through the Big Bang was really writing, which was invented in four places about 5,000 years ago, you know, uh, Mesopotamia, Egypt, uh, Mesoamerica, and China. Mm. And then the alphabet in Eastern Mediterranean, and then, of course, the printing revolution. And that, that was the, the first big wave, you know, uh, uh, of technology. It's always been around in learning. Pens, pencils, the little eraser, the ability to rub out mistakes. These are all really significant things. And people imagine that technology is a recent thing in learning. It's always been there. Writing yeah. being a big one. Yeah. Then I think the second phase you mentioned was absolutely spot on. That's broadcast media. And there's a long history, talking about 100 years or so, of film and TV. Massive influence in education was used for decade after decade, especially in the US, also Europe and, and in America. And then we have radio, of course. Huge yeah. amount of learning took place through radio. And the podcast is the heir to radio, I suppose, in many ways in terms of audio. The bastard son like of, yeah. <laughs> I always like the fact that Martin Dugamas, who, who, who invented Moodle, was actually educated in the middle of the Western desert yeah. and actually used shortwave audio across radio and books dropped from an aeroplane <laughs> before the internet. And that's what really gave him an interest in technology, a bit like my story. And I, met, I, I know Martin, I, I, I met him in the... It's very interesting to look, look at how people got into this industry, you know. The technology was often the leading thing, not the learning, and then we came to appreciate the learning. And then, of course, things moved then on into what you called the, the computer age, let's call it that, uh, yeah. and that's where it got really interesting, yeah. So that's where I, I suppose most people would think e-learning really starts. But while there were kind of academic experiments on mainframes and the sort of thing you mentioned at Dartmouth and then the Plato thing, really it kind of starts with the personal computer, doesn't it? That's correct. So myself and Clive Shepard, we worked on the first Apple, the Apple II, the first PCs that came off the, the, the production line. And the, those, albeit rather primitive machines, run by floppy disks in the front and a hard disk, of course, and some RAM, 
uh, they were primitive, but they did the job. Mm. They became networked in what were called LANs or local area networks that gave you some networking across an organization so you could share things. Uh, and they did a good job. But it was really the storage devices that drove the industry, the add-ons, you know, things mm. like laser vision discs. The earliest one interesting that myself and Clive worked on was an interactive audio tape machine where you could control the tape and it would do, inter it would do branching by scrolling up and down the tape. <laughs> there was actually <laughs> one I did interactive podcasts on, which was just an audio tape, little audio cassettes, you know, the cassettes yeah. you could buy. And it would scroll up and down to the relevant uh, piece of audio, interactive podcast, John. Uh, how ahead of, of our time were we then? Oh, absolutely. And, well, it is interesting how much of the, the, the stuff that we now think is, is quite advanced and quite of the present moment was, was actually kind of around at that time. When you yeah. say the, the kind of LANs came in and networking of personal computers, what kind of data are we talking about there? Oh, you're talking about tiny amounts of data. Remember, this is before the internet, even before dial-up. Yeah. So these are sell sending relatively, you know, when I don't mean you know, pack multiple packets, but you're confined by and large to text. Yeah. Uh, but that wasn't such a bad thing. The strange thing about that era was how there's a great sort of line I like in the psychology of learning, which is less is usually more. Mm. And the great thing about having less to work with is it forced you, in a sense, to apply that principle in learning. You couldn't get mm. away with loads of fancy transitions, graphics, animation, and video because you couldn't. But it forced you to be incredibly creative with what the tools you had in mind. Only three colors, for example, on the BBC Micro. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> only three colors. Imagine giving that to a graphic artist. So we, you know, we didn't go mad with fonts and. And, I, you know, a lot of the stuff I see these days, in many ways, you know, there was a great deal of creativity in that era. This is the, from 1985, 84 onwards, laser vision discs, for example. We did yeah. amazing interactive branching storytelling, you know, and French language programs, conflict. I remember doing a program on a, on a drug for a, for a pharmaceutical company that, on reflux, you know, the heartburn. And we yeah. actually took a great big, video of a roller coaster and set the whole program on a live roller coaster with all wow. that machines. It was, I mean, I don't know how we got away with it, but we did. And we did some marvelous stuff then. Yeah. Something I kind of pick up when I talk to people about this era is that with each kind of successive leap ahead in technology, um, like going to, um, to the internet from CD-ROM and so on, you actually kind of, you, you'd got kind of quite rich media going on, you know, and, and then suddenly your bandwidth decreases again and you're almost back to square one. Is, That's correct. Did yeah. that happen a number of times over the 90s? Really? It did indeed, because with laser vision disc, you had full quality video, you know, yeah. uh, 36 minutes plus uh, two audio tracks, double up on that, and thousands and thousands of stills. And then suddenly when laser vision disappeared, you had nothing. When we went to the internet, so that was a cusp here, you suddenly find that, found that that disappeared on you. You couldn't use video and of no. course however there's a great line in the psychology of learning so less is more is one media rich is not mind rich you know yeah. in fact very often you see bad design based on uh, cognitive overload basically with far too much stuff video is a good example you know mm. we watch video but we only have a 20 second attention span and it, the memory of the video burns up behind you like a shooting star which is why you can watch a whole box set on Netflix. And then when I ask you the next day, what was in episode three, you can't remember. Uh, you know, it's a, because video has an emotional impact. It doesn't really have a high cognitive impact. Yeah. So people are making all those mistakes because they've got a smorgasbord and stuff in front of them and they just grab it all, you know, rather than taking it very carefully. You know, the best food is a very simple starter, a very simple main course. Is that, you know, we've lost that bit. Technology was moving very fast in the 90s, laser disc, floppy disk, eventually to online delivery right. uh, with all those successive changes. And how did that affect what you're able to do in terms of, of design? And also, I'm quite interested to know what was the kind of um, prevailing sense of what learning, you know, what learning science told you to do at the time. Because one of the interesting things from the Plato project was that they were years ahead of their time, not only they didn't have a technical infrastructure to, to, to support what they were doing. But they said that when they went to the, the literature, um, there wasn't that much there. It was still very kind of Skinnerite, behaviorist, 
didn't Correct. necessarily support them in, in what they're trying to do intellectually. So if we kind of look at folks on that era of the yeah. 90s, how was kind of the literature feeding into that for you? Yeah, I don't think that they were right in that observation, to be honest, because the literature on, was already well underway in cognitive psychology. You know, behaviorism was a 50s and 60s thing. Like, yeah. I mean, let me illustrate that by example. Myself and Clive Shepard built an interactive tutoring system on the back of basic PCs and floppy disks. Yeah. That was the late. That was in the nineties. Now that intel that in, you know intelligent tutoring system did what adaptive learning is doing now. It was gathering data on everything you did. We then stored that data, measured it against the an imaginary student perfect model, and guided you through the course. And we did that in the 90s on a very basic thing because data is relatively small, you know, thing to handle. The processing power was enough. And we had a graphic of a training center and you got sent to the library if you needed some, you know, some basic stuff. Uh, you had some video stuff on laser vision disk if you needed simulations. We did, you know, we did loads. But there were those who read the literature and those who didn't, to be fair. You know, there were mm. some who were a wee bit more intellectually curious about learning and others. And it's still true today. You find in those days, you got a lot of BBC type people who came in and just wanted to do television and interactive. You know, right. this was a huge, I think, break on the progress in the UK. And I, I, I really do believe that the BBC micro and so on. People think it was great, but it held us back, you know, in terms of tech companies and the development of hardware. It, but there were those who came from a different intellectual background, not a media production background, who yeah. were far more interested in the learning. And we did some great things there. You know, the sort of space practice stuff we see now, we were doing it back then. Uh, and then it went into the multimedia phase almost, where you had a lot of media people. Mm. Uh, and you, you remember, you know, BBC got like 70-odd million to, to do BBC Jam. Never produced a single minute of learning at the back of oh. it. It was such a waste. But the industry forged through until the next big stage, of course, which was the internet. And then we have Wikipedia, you have Google, of course. Mm. And their technology really started to shape pedagogy, I think, yeah. in a big way. People don't like this phrase, but it did. Google, yeah. Google Scholar, Wikipedia, YouTube and video, uh, and we now have Spotify and podcasts. You know, the technology is a big causal factor in all this. So the internet was really a, a, a step change. I, yeah. I think you'd had kind of Moore's law was driving things. You had um, uh, progressive changes in the storage media and so on. But but the internet was, was really a, a complete paradigm shift in a sense. However, my memory of that era is a kind of a massive impatience because you take the step back. Bandwidth was limited. It was these kind of dial-up mo dial modems for for most people and so on. This impatience for that to get big enough that you could actually do some, something useful with it. What, what was your experience of the internet? Well, that's right. What so, did you do in the dot-com boom? Right. Well, what, what people seem to forget was there was there were hybrid technologies then. So we were using CD-ROM had come along. So all PCs had a yeah. CD slot in the front of it. And that gave you a considerable amount of local storage for video, audio, and other things, stills and so on, graphics. So... A, a good example, will be, you know, so you had these hybrid systems that solved the media side of the equation and give you some local storage in addition to dial up. Mm. A, but some really wonderful things happened then. I'll give, I'll give you two really interesting examples. So on CD-ROM, uh, we did loads. Let me give a real example. The joy of, we did the Joy of Sex, the Alex Comfort book, for example, in CD-ROM. <laughs> <laughs> and that had, that had a Mr. and Mrs. game. You know, you ask the husband, you ask the wife, blah, 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 and then compare answers. And uh, I remember... <laughs> I've got an interesting uh, story. Somebody reminded me of this recently. We got sent the drawings, which were worth a fortune. You know, they're really beautiful drawings in that book. They were quite famous. Yeah. A Securicorn van arrived. We had to pay insurance, and one was missing. And it was the one of an erect penis, as it happens. And we had to get... <laughs> so the publisher were really annoyed. It wasn't us. You know, it got stolen. And uh, the publisher asked us to get a local artist. I got a friend of mine to do a, an erect penis, yeah. which he did. But he had to use himself as a model in a mirror. <laughs> and he, he phoned me at the end of the first day and said, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Donald, but I'm really struggling here, you know, because every time he went to do the life drawing, it, 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 it took its natural course. So I paid him another extra day. It took him two days that he got it done. But those were the days, you know, a bit buccaneering, but we had yeah. to, you know, those hybrid media. Yeah. Well, I think we've all had delivery problems with Amazon, <laughs> things not turning up, but I don't think I've ever, they've ever lost a boner for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. 
<laughs> so, so we, you know, I think that hybrid period was interesting. CD-ROM, CDI was another thing. And yeah. remember, a lot of this was driven by consumer technology. People think laser vision was a training medium. It wasn't. It was meant to store movies. I remember going to Thailand and being in this remote island, and the guy had a laser vision disc. He struck, stuck a movie on every night. Because that's the big. That's where the big money has always been. I think mm -hmm. we forget this in the learning technologies field that consumer technology is the fundamental driver every time. And if it works in the consumer world, it becomes learning technology. Mm. And, that, and that's what happened. So, you know, in that era, we had dial-up, but that eventually became broadband. That was the big freeing up that bottleneck you re rightly referred to there, John. Yeah. And then, we could, then you could access things, you know, at any time, 24 hours a day at low cost, Wikipedia, YouTube, Google, Google Scholar, all that stuff suddenly exploded. It was like, I mean, it was as, as big as printing, you know, it was it, and has had a profound influence on learning and our species as a whole. Uh, the World Wide Web browsers, you know, that when they came along, people remember that it was quite primitive in the early days, but as soon as you had a functional browser, things took off. You could deliver learning through those browsers, although they weren't in the early days still the two browsers. Then we had the development of course, big corporates realized that they were networked in a much more sophisticated way, had access to the internet. So you have the, the emergence of the LMS. They wanted to manage learning. And that was a double-edged sword. You are data. You are data. You are data. You are data. Every pulse of your heart, every step you take, the place you travel to, the thing that gets your attention, it all leaves a trace in data. And the world reconfigures itself around you, moment to moment, based on that data. You are data. You are data. data has learned a lot about you over the years. Isn't it time you learned more about data? You are data. You are data. You are data. Data is a hot topic in learning right now, perhaps the hottest. But when you look at what's happened historically with learning analytics, it's hard to deny that it's been a little bit stuck. Stuck in the first two levels of Kirkpatrick. Stuck in what David Wilson and Charles Jennings have called the conspiracy of convenience. Stuck in a lack of capability, money and time to evaluate. So how can we get ourselves out of this endless Mobius loop of wanting to do it all but ending up not actually doing very much. I've talked to a lot of experts and practitioners, and the result is a whole series of guides and resources that Learning Pool will be releasing to help you map your way out of that loop. Download the first of these now. The Data and Learning White Paper. You are data, you are data, you are data. The LMS kind of predated the internet era, though. I mean, didn't you have kind of like desktop installed versions of LMSs and, and so on? Yes. Oh, yeah. There were primitive versions. In fact, we built one at Epic. You know, we built, and then you had authoring languages. We had Clive Shepard wrote one called Procal. We all had to sort of write our own tools in many ways. And mm. they were all quite small and quite primitive. But of course, as usual, the Americans primarily came in and you had the uh, you know, some total, a click to learn, plateau. All these were then subsequently bought by people like Skillsoft and Success Factories. In fact, yeah. they're still around today. If you look and at that, Success that, Factories, that MA activity is still going on, isn't it? With the kind of yeah. cornerstone acquisition of Saba as the most recent, I think, consolidation. Well, there, there's a very interesting thing happened, of course. We have had this paradigm of the LMSs. Many of these LMSs were, are old LMSs, and it's really lipstick on a pig type development they've got. Success factors at SAP, for example, was the plateau system goes years and years back. Yeah. Same is true of Skillsoft. So they all have origins in old client server technology. And that's why they're not making the grade in a new big paradigm shift into LXPs. So you have learning management systems, storage really in the management of learner and learnings, learners, but quite unsophisticated pedagogically. You know, they really can't do what we need to do. Another very interesting thing happened there, I think, in terms of the history of technology, which was both a blessing, but more of a disaster. It was about 20 years ago, ADL, the American Defense, 
came uh, came up. This is Cold War stuff, really. Came up with Scorm, the standard, mm-hmm. and I remember it coming out and being and writing critically about it because it yeah. was really Elliot Maisie, Wayne Hodgkins, a whole load of people who didn't really know. I don't think what they were doing, but they were big on the Lego brick analogy. You know, the idea that learning was all a number of objects and you reconstitute courses by taking your Lego bricks and putting them in another order. Yeah. This led to the hideous standard that is SCORM. So the completion of a little learning object then was the completion of a course. And we didn't gather useful data about learning. We gathered the wrong data, simple data, not enough data to make the system sing as they should pedagogically. And we're only just now, 20 years later, breaking the back of what is like a standard that is primitive as a postage stamp, you know? Mm. And that's because XAPI has come along. Mm. And now we have another, this paradigm shift isn't into LXPs, really. It's a paradigm shift into data, AI, LXPs. But data is the big thing. That's what's driving it. That's what makes XAPI work. I think we ought to go back and look at another big change that happened around kind of... um, 2009, 2010, which is mobility, where you start to get kind of mobile devices that you can, um, and, and, you, and, the, and, the, and the birth of mobile learning and tablets and so on. And that's a big change as well, that liberation from the desktop. Yeah, so I hesitate that it was a liberation from the desktop mobility. I don't think it was a liberation necessarily always in terms of learning. So if we take tablets as an example, yeah. I think that was one of those Two steps forward, you know, one step forward, two steps back in many cases. So we had the massive procurement of tablets, which were designed originally by Apple and others as entertainment devices. Now, as mm. you sit down there and you click on movies and so on and so forth, they were never designed to be lean forward. They're always lean back devices. So schools bought them by the hundreds and thousands, and many of those projects were disastrous. The mm. famous California project, unbelievable sums of money spent on tablets. And there's a big problem with tablets because nobody in their right mind, no student going to university would buy a tablet then because who would write an essay pecking away like a, like a hen <laughs> by grains trying to type a long form uh, piece of prose. You wouldn't code on a tablet using touch screen. You know? So there mm. all these tools, all these things you had to teach kids weren't suited to that medium. And it was, you know, a device fetish, I would say, you know, that people were buying devices and not thinking about learning. And this was at its worst in schools and in some universities. It was only when keyboard, and then, of course, they had to buy the keyboards to add to the tablets, making it mm. even more expensive. And then people say, well, you're just, that's a laptop. <laughs> you know, why yeah. don't you buy a Google, a Chrome laptop, which was, you know, like a third of the price. Mm. And so the tablet has faded somewhat, I think. And then mobile was different. There is a problem with mobiles, however, in learning, and that they give you all the mobility, but that small screen experience is a bit transitory. And yeah. I always remember this wonderful piece of research by Nass and Reeves showing the smaller the screen on video, the less retention. They measured three screen yeah. sizes, measured retention. And so you've got to be careful about mobile learning. Nevertheless, it did free people up to do learning wherever they were at any time. And those, I mean, I have a Google AI delivered phone. My phone has moved into the almost the LXP AI data world, you know? Hmm. Uh, This is what mobile has given us now. It's given us a leap forward in technology, use of images, especially in photography and so on, replace the camera. So it, it, it was an extra form of disintermediation and the democratization of technology. This goes back to the premise I said, you know, consumer tech always drives learning technology. And, uh, and now when we've moved into this era now, we're, you know, everything is mediated by AI, except learning. But learning has to move in that direction and already mm. is. So yeah. LXPs, AI and data is the new, the new consumer technology that's driving learning technology. And there are good things and bad things about that, the, the fact that consumer technology drives anything, everything, aren't there? I mean, the, the good side being familiarity, that, that the people can engage with that very quickly because they're kind of, they're used to it, you know, they, yeah, they use it all correct. the time in their lives. Maybe the bad thing is around the expectations that um, we, we get these things like ideas like the Netflix of learning. Um, again and again, it seems that lean back media come into learning, bump up against this thing that actually learning can't be done as lean back. It, it requires leaning in, requires yeah. difficulty and so on. 
Yeah, you, you, you really often have to unpack those phrases. I mean, the Netflix the learning, I think, is a, a really good thing in one sense. So if you take the interface, which is the same interface as, as YouTube and all streaming services, it's great, you know, because it, it has... It's familiar globally, so everybody knows how to use it. You don't have to train anybody. You know that scrolling mm. up, scrolling left and right. It extends the real estate of the screen beautifully. You know, it means you can get loads of stuff on. People know where they are at any one point. It has a little search button, which is great for LXP systems, you know, to interrogate the learning that may be on your system. Uh, so that notion of a familiar global standard and interface design means you don't have to worry about hiring a UX designer for that. That's what the great thing about Netflix. What you were referring to is that expectation that, yeah, we deliver a whole load of videos and that's enough. No, it's not. But of course, good LXPs like Stream from Learning Pool and so on, they use the Netflix interface, which is absolutely spot on. If you're using a social interface, you would use something obviously chatbot-ish like uh, Twitter or Facebook. Hmm. But the old LMS interface, which was the nested menu system, was horrific, you know, going through three menus to find anything you ever wanted. Yeah. But to go back to the Netflix model, I think the Netflix interface is dominant quite rightly. But now we object things, different media types like podcasts and video, but also interactive content and, uh, and the much more sophisticated things, you know. On an LXP, you can upload your own videos. You can get peers to critique that video. These are all features in the stream LXP so it's much more than Netflix because it's a learning system. So you take the good things from Netflix, but you take the good things that we've learned over the last 50 or odd years about the use of online learning. We're seeing a much bigger emphasis nowadays on designing systems with the learner experience in mind, yeah. rather than, and I know this is going to sound like a caricature, for the convenience of the administrator, so I know you feel that there are dangers in focusing too much on giving the learner a fun experience, but in general, do you think learning systems are in a better place as a result? One thing that came out of talking to Paige Chen last time was that for a long time, kind of content and learning systems were in a different box and all the instructional design was going into the content and none into the, to the learning system. It seems that now we're in a place where you can, learning systems are such that you can apply a kind of pedagogy, instructional design to them. Are we generally in a better place now, do you think? Yes and no. It's similar to the previous, you know, there's a theme coming through. There's always a yes and no, isn't it? There's always yeah. an and a disadvantage. <laughs> it's been the recurring theme of this talk. Yeah. With learning experience design, take those three words because I think they're illustrative and they're in the right order. If learning experience design leads us to take learning seriously, the theory of learning, the psychology of learning, then that would be a great thing. And by that, I mean good cognitive psychology, but also dumping, you know, learning styles and all that stuff. So I think a lot of learning experience designers think it's all about experience and not learning. Big mistake. If you're not building that pedagogy into good pedagogy into your experiences, then you'll make the same mistakes as all the multimedia people made way back in the 90s. So learning is important. The experience thing is important. But I think people, again, don't realize that, you know, we've had a lot, this goes back to McKellen's article in the 90s, and others, we've talked about learning experiences for years. That phrase was used in that article. And we have people like Donald Norman, who wrote, some, you know, emotional, uh, uh, you know, emotional design was his big book, design, other design books. And he gave us a little warning about this, not to be too obsessed by words like empathy, for example. And people forget this is the big guru, the big academic in the field said empathy is a completely misleading phrase. A, you know, a 23-year-old graduate isn't going to have much empathy. They're not going to have, really have much empathy with a guy using a volt stick in, a, a, in an electrical system while he's underground looking at cables. And he thinks that em empathy is mistaken. You know, in other words, you won't have empathy for the 10,000 people in that course. You don't know them. You don't know what it's really like. What you need is understanding. You need to know what their needs are, where they're going to be doing the learning, and do some proper analysis. So I think the, you know, the, we, we really have to be careful about not creating a whole lot of things that learning experience designers like on video and cartoons and speech bubbles and all that sort of stuff, but which you're, you know, 35-year-old guy who works uh, uh, as a fitter finds abhorrent. So that's the danger that we just create all these experiences and gamification and gaming, I think, is a good example, you know. Yeah, you know, the, the idea that, you know, I, you know, that all adults love playing games and learning, you know, really? 
I, I don't think so. And I think, I think, you know, the the, learn, the experience portion, we have to be really careful with what we mean by experience. I've just finished a book on this, on learning experience design, and I've been very careful to go through experiences. You know, if you take text and graphics, yeah, the long history of that, the book, <laughs> then so yeah, it's massive. Uh, we, we know how to use text and graphics on screens very carefully. Then we have audio, this podcast, a rich history, and we know what we're doing with radio. We know what good radio is, Mm. Therefore, we know what good podcasts are, and yours is a perfect example. Uh, then if we move on into video and animation, we've had a century of that. You go on into scenarios, simulations, games, gamification, VR, AR, uh, social learning. We know a lot about this. And the danger is we strip it all back to learning is fun. You know, the Disneyfication of online learning is something I've seen a hint of. Not all, but th this is a real danger, that the media cowboys come back and we think it's all about television, movies, fun. And then, of course, design, learning experience and design, the third word is terribly important because one of the good things about LXP is it's moved us towards more agile uh, process in terms of design, getting us away from the waterfall or ADI process. You've got to write all this documentation. You've got the subject matter experts involved, spend weeks, if not months, building this stuff. Mm. So we've had more guerrilla learning. You know, well, just get a microphone and go and ask the subject matter expert and record some stuff. Yeah. It, Shoot a video, you know, from your phone. Do that sort of stuff. That's great. You know, resources, the use of resources. We've been using that in wildfire. You know, you send me a PowerPoint, a video, a, a document, and we within the same day we create the course. So agile production has been one of the big benefits of the LXD world. But many mm. of the LXD practitioners want to go into almost like movie production on this stuff, you know, and go back and say, that's yeah. about. I think yeah. that's interesting. Interesting to go back kind of, 10, 15 years or, or 10, 15 minutes in terms of this discussion, um, how, how big a word authoring was. Um, uh, yeah. That has changed, hasn't it, with the, with the growth of user-generated content, which is now such an important part, part of everything. Yeah, I mean, you know, in terms of learning experiences, you know, some experiences are better in terms of learning. You know, it's not all about, you know, and what are the better experiences? Well, they're the experiences that result in practice and transfer, you know, mm. they're the experiences that really change things in long-term memory, not just short-term fun. And this is what we may be, may be missing a little bit here. You've got to work hard at this and understand how practice and transfer actually works. A huge amount of literature on this that nobody ever reads, of course, mm. uh, because we're getting so fixated by just what you see in the screen in front of you. Uh, I think that's changing somewhat, and, and it will take time, but it will change for the better, very much so. I'm not going to ask you to kind of predict the future because nobody ever answers that question because it's just too <laughs> it's too advantaged to fortune. But what do you think the important driving forces are now in technology that will take us forward, the stuff that's around now? And I'm, I'm guessing it's around AI and data. You know, I think, funnily enough, we are in the position now, just because of the timing of this, to actually predict the future because it's actually an extension of the past. Mm -hmm. So everything, I mean, everything you do online is mediated by data and driven by data. And whether you buy, you know, Netflix obviously is a data-driven system. You've got a personalized tiled screen in front of you that's unique to you. It's personalized entertainment. And that, of course, is an even bigger potency in the learning world because personalized learning is an even greater gift, in a sense, in learning than it is in entertainment. Uh, and then, so the, the data lies at the heart of this. That's the underbelly of all this. So all the LXP systems are really... They're really data-driven systems doing things with data, you know, which is why Stream has a learning record store, a learning locker underneath it. That's the well which we draw upon to make this stuff sing and work. So I think the very fact that, you know, whether it's Google, YouTube, uh, you know, uh, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, all of it, data and AI-driven, and learning is beginning to be that through LXP systems and data stores, you know, getting all your data in one place in the right format so you can really use it sensibly. So in a sense, I think we can predict the future now because it's, it's actually an extension of a past. The internet is actually an AI system now. Uh, you, the reason you don't receive dick pics in your email is because AI filters it all out. Same is true in YouTube. AI is performing all those invisible tasks. 
And it does the same thing in learning now. You know, it gives good feedback. It propels the learn forward. I just wrote a piece recently called Feedback. It shouldn't be called Feedback. It should be called Feed Forward. <laughs> you know, it's all about moving people on. And that's what good technology does. You know, semantically interpreting your answers as open input. Let's, du- let's get rid of simple drag and drop. You know, drag and drop. Is there anything more tedious than that? or mm-hmm. multiple choice questions, the plague on online learning, AI gives us the ability to do some amazing things beyond that, the interpretation of answers that you type in. This is acting more like teachers historically and teaching historically. And then you've got things mm-hmm. like GPT-3, the creation of content using AI. Uh, we've seen how powerful, and it's a fledgling thing, but it's already amazingly powerful. So I think we ha- it's not that... It's a shot in the darkness. The whole internet is an AI-driven system. Learning is beginning to be AI and data-driven. For me, that's a thoroughly good thing. Okay. Have we kind of escaped the dynamic that we were talking earlier, where with each kind of subsequent um, invention of a new technology, uh, kind of instructional standards take a step back in a way? or media richness certainly takes a step back in a way. It, is that kind of over now, now that everything is cloud and internet and we seem to have, you know, large amounts of bandwidth available? No, I think it's just that the hybrid between media and what you do with the media is more sophisticated. So let's take video as an example. I think video is an incredibly important medium in terms of learning. But it's mm. only now that we're beginning to get to grips with what that medium really uses. It's good to focus on video. So we know that over long video is a mistake in learning. So the big data set from MIT showed that about six minutes, people go and get a cup of tea in learning Mm. video. We know that from the big MOOC data set. So be careful about length. We know that people get emotional and attitudinal shift in video. That's what video is very good at. That's why we love to watch movies and drama. Mm. But it's not particularly good at semantic information or learning mathematics or detailed knowledge because our working memory, you know, as I say, has this 20 second scan and it's burning up memory behind us. So we get the emotional impact, but we don't get the cognitive change in long-term memory. So watching video is great, I think, but it needs to be supplemented then by uh, some deeper processing and cognitive effort. Mm. And that's, you know, we're doing that wildfire, but that's where, you know, you then have to say, okay, we know what the nine forms of direct discrimination are in the workplace. Right. Do you know what those nine forms of direct discrimination are watching the video? Not a chance. But if you do then go on and actually get them to type them in and look at worked examples and think about how it applies to them in a workplace, you really start to get somewhere. So we're getting that nice blend between the use of data, uh, uh, the the use of the media themselves. uh, I use that word blend in a very positive sense here. I think it's getting much more sophisticated. And AI, in a sense, is doing what the teacher normally does, the brain of a teacher does, or lecturer, or whatever. It's guiding the student, giving them personalized, appropriate feedback at the right time. It's the hand of the tutor and the teacher, rather than the exposition coming out the mouth of a teacher. This is why technology like the blackboard was so destructive. You know, at that moment, uh, a guy called Pillin, Scotsman, who invented it, uh, early 19th, late uh, 18th century, Suddenly, teachers turned their back on the students, you know, <laughs> caused chaos in classrooms, you know. You, you, and yeah. you still, you know, I remember seeing it when I went to university. A guy just writes and screeds his stuff up on three blackboards. So technology can be a bad thing, but I think this technology most mimics what good pedagogy should be and good teaching is, mm. which is why we should embrace it and not see it as the enemy, which some people do, of course. I suppose looking at that, a question occurs to me that isn't that well formulated, but <laughs> so maybe you can help me with it. Do we kind of get a convergence where all these things like um, VR, adaptive systems, AI, the sort of collaborative and social side of learning that we have, do we get, do we get a situation where all that kind of converges to make uh, very good, powerful systems? Or do we end up, do you think, with a kind of divergence where certain people will go off in a, in a very directive, adaptive learning sort of thing where it's about the individual interacting with the AI that corrects their mistakes, um, adaptively changes the content for them to see. But it's a very kind of locked-in hermetic type of um, system. 
versus the more kind of open-ended type of thing that we have. And, and then again, you have kind of virtual reality, simulation-based sort of learning. Do, do that, does all that converge or does it diverge? Well, at the, I think at the heart of the system, you have convergence because you have some very powerful species of AI, for example. So image recognition, you have mm -hmm. a natural language processing, you have uh, a whole load of individual things that lie at the heart of the system. So a good example, speech to text and text to speech, which has revolutionized accessibility for people with disabilities. And, you know, people conveniently forget that AI did that, you know, and does it very, very well. And it's given us those devices in our homes and in our cars, revolutionizing the interface, making it more frictionless and so on. So that's underlying convergence on one type of technology. But mm. think of the divergence that that's produced. You know, you have sat-nav systems in your car. I mean, who would go? Who wants to go back to an Atlas on the passenger seat? It'd be madness. Uh, we have a... Uh, you know, those devices, A-L-E-X-A-L, say, because it's sitting next to me with Spark into action, which I use on a daily basis. Uh, and beyond that, I think, into the this ecosystem of learning things, you get massive divergence. So mm -hmm. in the gaming industry, for example, because VR is now driven by the gaming industry, there's a massive amount of interesting things happening there. So you had all these kids recently going into the stock market because they had learned how to short stocks on RuneScape. Mm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's really, so, uh, and, and I don't think people who don't play games really understand how sophisticated and how much AI there is in gaming these days mm. and all the VR stuff on the back of that and training. And then you have tech search, Google, Wikipedia, Google Scholar. I mean, all those academics who complain about AI and use Google Scholar every day, you go, really? And they demand transparency of all algorithms? Well, you better shut down Google Scholar then because it's a proprietary algor algorithm. Are you not going to use it because you don't know how it works? It's lunacy to demand that you have to know how Google Scholar works <laughs> before you use it. Of course, it's conveniently ignored. Beyond mm. that, into all these other media types, John, uh, even on podcasts and audio, you know, and we uh, we are in courses producing audio automatically from text files. So you get this divergence and sophistication of sort of thousand flowers blooming because the underlying technology is so powerful, mm. be used in many many different ways. I mean, I, I was looking at a thing called Dali, you know, which is the name came from the artist Salvador Dali and Wally -E, the movie, mm. and that's. That's a form of GPT-3, a form of AI that produces images automatically from text. And so, and I, I had a look at this, some absolutely astounding, some of the images it's producing. Now imagine creating online learning where I just give you a text file and it produces its own images to help the learner. How cool would that be? Or imagine GPT-3, the same software really, and another form of AI where it has all the works of Karl Marx, everything Karl Marx ever said and wrote along with Engels and then all the modern Marxists. And you can actually see Karl Marx as an animated figure and ask him questions. And he'll come back. What is dialectical materialism? How, <laughs> how did Hegel influence you? You know, <laughs> and so on and so forth. What do you think of technology? So, you know, we, this sounds like science fiction. It's not really. GPT-3 already has examples like this. That, that yeah. have been it's fledgling, but it will happen. So we're seeing, to go back to your question, this is divergence or convergence. I think you have a lot of, you know, it's like an iceberg, a lot of hidden stuff happening in AI, huge advances being made that will allow many, many wonderful things ha to happen pedagogically. Mm. We're seeing all of that emerge now, which is why it's never been more exciting, really, the way in which technology is driving learning. So it's not, I don't think it's restricting at all. And of course, it's really a design issue. It's not, you can design highly adaptive systems that are incredibly useful. You know, if, you, if you're learning mathematics, you have mm -hmm. to really focus on addition, then subtraction, then division, multiplication. You can't leap into multiplying fractions without knowing that stuff. So sometimes yeah. very formal approach works, but they will also look at the games industry. You have these complete open games where you just go into this open world and thrash around, you know, and everything in between. And that's what this technology has to offer here. It's not, it can be highly restrictive, but it can be highly liberating. Hmm. I think you've painted a really interesting, exciting, and um, incentivizing vision of the future for L&D people with that. Thank you very much, Donald. No problem, John. It's been a pleasure. 
That's all on the Learning Hack podcast for this time. Many thanks to Donald and to our sponsors, Learning Pool. The Learning Hack is completely independent and transparently funded by sponsorship. Please subscribe on your podcast platform of choice or on YouTube. You can tweet me at John Helmer or contact me through my website, johnhelmerconsulting.com. We're always keen to hear your feedback. Or should I say, feed forward. Coming up on The Learning Hack. Next time, it's the 702010 man, Charles Jennings. And then we've got Toby Harris, Mia Jam Nealon, Greg Collins, and a lot of very exciting new bonus content and specials I can't wait to tell you about. Until next time. Stay classy, learning people. Now I finally get it. Good morning, John. Morning. How are you? I'm very well, young man. How are you? Good. Thank you. So, well, since then, I was called me young man. (laughs) (laughs) It's all relative, John. (laughs) Uh, I know. And I inadvertently got called a a guru yesterday. That was fun. Ah, good stuff. No, I think you've earned that status.